Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to another great session of Controversies in Cardiology. I'm Marty Goldman. Um, on behalf of Dal uh, Valentin Fuster and myself, welcome. Today's topic is actually something which is um, extraordinarily important for cardiologists, but probably only became in vogue as cardiologists being aware of uh, its importance um, and how we can be uh, the first detectors uh, just in the last few years. We always knew that diabetes was a significant risk factor for coronary disease, but its significance and true significance and how it impacts patients and our care of patients uh, truly only became uh, very, very uh, obvious when studies like Barry and Freedom Trial, as uh, Dr. Fuster has taught us, um, has become apparent that we as cardiologists can be frontline diagnosticians in, in treatment. Um, one of the um, most in interesting aspects of recognizing that overlap of interest between endocrinology and cardiology is what uh, Dr. Mechanic and Dr. Fusta opened at the Wellness Center on 85th Street, um, where a endocrinologist, Jeff Mechanic, a world famous uh, endocrinologist, helps treat our patients with cardiovascular disease and try to prevent their developing cardiovascular disease. We'll hear more about it. Uh, from Dr. Fuster in a few minutes. It's really a great pleasure to have Dr. Moliterno um, as our visiting professor. As you'll hear more detail from Dr. Fuster, he's editor-in-chief of uh, Sister, or maybe a daughter journal of Jack, um, Jack Intervention, Cardiovascular Intervention. Uh, the topic, as I said, is coronary artery disease and diabetes mellitus, and it's a very large topic, and one of our first-year fellows, Steve Alexander, has put together really a tremendous monograph on the paper, and he's going to give us an overview of the topic. Thank you, Dr. Goldman, and thanks again, Dr. Militerno. It's really been a privilege and truly a pleasure having you with us today. As we all know, diabetes is a colossal problem. In 2014, it affected 8.5% of the global adult population, and prevalence is rising. Coronary artery disease is the principal comorbid condition and the primary driver of mortality in patients with diabetes. Happily, over the past decade, there have been several important discoveries and developments in the field of diabetes and cardiovascular disease research. Inflammation is now understood to be a key factor and the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes and its associated vascular complications. IL-1 beta, a cytokine that is overproduced in diabetes, is central to the inflammatory response and drives the IL-6 signaling pathway. The CANTOS trial examined the use of canakinumab, a monoclonal antibody targeting IL-1 beta, in patients with coronary artery disease and showed benefit. In contrast, the follow-up CERT trial examined the use of low-dose methotrexate in diabetics with coronary artery disease and did not show benefit. These results suggest that a targeted rather than shotgun approach to inflammation is more likely to be beneficial in the treatment of cardiovascular disease. Multiple trials of immune-targeted therapy for type 2 diabetes are ongoing. In 2008, the Food and Drug Administration mandated cardiovascular safety trials for all new diabetes drugs. Unintentionally, several of the studies that followed demonstrated not only safety, but benefit. For the first time, two classes of glucose-lowering therapies, the SGLT2 inhibitors and the GLP-1 receptor agonists, were shown to directly improve cardiovascular outcomes. Recommendations have now emerged supporting the use of these medications to reduce cardiovascular risk, a fundamental change in the landscape of diabetes management. Despite this progress, several important topics remain controversial. A high-dose form of purified fish oil, icosapent ethyl, recently showed benefit in reducing cardiovascular events, but has emerged against a backdrop of previously negative trials. The use of aspirin for primary cardiovascular disease prevention in diabetics has been called into question following the results of the ASCEND trial and other primary prevention studies. The role of screening for asymptomatic coronary disease in diabetics is unclear. 
with the American and European guidelines differing in their recommendations. And finally, the efficacy of cabbage versus PCI in diabetic patients with multivessel coronary disease has been a matter of debate for decades. In 2012, the Freedom Trial was published and was the first study to clearly demonstrate the superiority of cabbage in this group of patients. Specifically, the trial randomized 1,900 patients to cabbage versus PCI. And after a, mean follow, after a median follow-up of 3.8 years, the cabbage group had a 30% relative risk reduction in the primary composite endpoint compared with the PCI group. The recently published Freedom Follow-On study demonstrated the durability of these results over extended follow-up with a clear mortality benefit in favor of cabbage. The results seem definitive. Critics will point to improvements in stent design and PCI techniques that have occurred since the trial. However, a recent large analysis of 11 trials comprised of roughly 12,000 patients showed a mortality benefit with cabbage over PCI, even with newer generation drug-eluting stents. Regarding the preferred revascularization method in diabetics with multivessel disease, there is likely no controversy. Uh, very uh, outstanding report here, or review of the subject, uh, Steve. And uh, so let me introduce today our visiting professor, Dr. Uh, David Moliterno, who uh, is a very accomplished individual, who I know well, obviously, uh, being the editor of Jack Intervention. And just let me say a few things about him. Uh, he uh, attended college at uh, the University of Michigan, <clears throat> medical school at the Medical College of Virginia. And then he had in his internship and in residency in medicine uh, at the Vanderbilt University Hospitals. He has his fellowship of cardiology at the Cleveland Clinic. And um, then he became an assistant professor at the Cleveland Clinic in 1994. And then he moved into medical uh, director of the uh, Cardiology Investigation Investigations Association there in Cleveland, associate professor, medical director of angiographic uh, core laboratory. Um, then um, after that stay in Cleveland, he uh, moved to uh, the University of Kentucky, where he had a number of positions. Um, he became chief of the Division of Cardiovascular Medicine, uh, Jefferson Morris Gill Professor of Cardiology, Professor of Medicine, uh, Physician in Chief of the Cardiovascular Service Line, and then um, certainly Chairman of Medicine and presently Vice Dean and Vice President for Clinical Affairs at the University of Kentucky College of Medicine and, um, and Healthcare. So he's very accomplished. He, he has a large number of awards. Um, Simon Duck Award of the General American College, where his reviews and his performance, uh, best doctors to, from 2001 to 2016. And then he has a number of awards, uh, fellow awards from uh, Merck, from Bristol, Myers, from Syntax, and so forth. He uh, has been involved. Uh, uh, as an editor-in-chief of CATH SAP-3, which is Cardiac Catheterization and Interventional Cardiology Self-Assessment Program from, from 2006 to 2014, a guest editor of Circulation, section editor of Journal of Thrombosis and Thrombolysis, and certainly editor-in-chief since uh, 2017 of CHAC Cardiovascular Intervention. Now, the... Um, he had a number of leadership positions at the American Heart and the American College. American College Publications Committee, uh, Kentucky Chapter Governance Board, uh, chair of the annual scientific sessions, interventional scientific council, uh, 
an American Heart Association uh, Central Kentucky Chapter Board of Directors. Now, his bibliography is impressive. Um, actually, he has more than 300 papers, very much focused in coronary artery disease, but in all aspects of coronary artery disease, from the functional to the anatomical to the subclinical to the functional and so forth. And the papers in very top journals. Actually, his first paper was on cocaine. It was one of the first papers on cocaine and coronary artery disease. And actually, this was in 1991, where he described the vasoconstrictive effect of, uh, of cocaine in coronary disease. Well, I could go on and on and on. I think you, we have a, an outstanding person with us today to discuss a very complex subject, the subject of diabetes and coronary artery disease. And let me now ask you, David, to come and let me give you the plaque, the, at least uh, the certificate Thank of you. honor that you have been here. Here it says all the good things about you. <laughs> and we signed, we signed in that memorial lecture February 25, 28 what that means is that for you people, you cannot go into answers that last for more than half a minute, one minute. Otherwise, we will not make it. All right? All agree? Good. The subjects are uh, the following. We are going to begin to talk about why the subject is important. We'll talk about the mechanisms of diabetes, the issue of the risk factors associated with diabetes, how do we approach them? The pharmacological agents in diabetes in general already associated with coronary disease. Uh, the issue of screening that was mentioned by Steve. Should we screen all patients with diabetes for coronary artery disease? And then there is the issue of intervention with acute coronary syndromes, with a stable disease, and then about three or four evolving aspects that are of quite, of quite of interest. So let me begin actually by asking you, Steve. You, you, you started by um, making, if I count properly, eight points about diabetes, why the subject that we are dealing with today is important. And I, I am going to mention them, and you are going to tell me which one is the one that you are most impressed by. First, the prevalence, as you mentioned, of diabetes in the adult population is 8.5% in this country. Point number two, although you do not expand enough there, is about obesity, which actually accounts for 90% of patients with type 2 diabetes, obesity. So to talk about diabetes without approaching obesity is really a lost cause. The point number three, is that certainly it behaves as coronary artery disease in terms of the risk. But even when you develop coronary artery disease, the events are significantly higher than other patients who have coronary artery disease without diabetes. And 
Another point that you make is that um, diabetes type 2 today is about 90% of those patients who develop coronary artery disease with diabetes. I suspect you mean that 10% is diabetes type 1. And then you make um, three comments about positive comments, the new agents, the peptide 1 receptor agonists and the sodium glucose contraporter to inhibitors. You make a comment and you mention this about that aspirin is falling apart on primary prevention. And then uh, you mentioned the Freedom Trial. I must say I read yesterday his comments about the Freedom Trial and he called controversial and I called him. I said, why are you calling controversial? So today the last statement that he said is it's not controversial. So I had some impact on, uh, on uh, Steve uh, on my phone call last night. Anyway, of all of these though, which is, uh, is an excellent review, an outstanding review, Wh which is the aspect that you have been most impressed uh, of all the things mentioned? Yeah, well, there's a lot there, but I think the most exciting for me have been the uh, new diabetes drugs showing reduction in cardiovascular risk. So to put this into historical context, I believe before these medications came out, and I think the EMPA reg outcome trial was published in 2015. Before that, no glucose lowering medication had ever shown uh, improvement in macrovascular outcomes, only in microvascular disease. So improvements in nephropathy and retinopathy, yeah. but never on MI or stroke. So the fact that these uh, glucose-lowering agents came out and actually reduced cardiovascular risk, uh, you know, over three years in the case of empagliflozin is really uh, remarkable. And as I said in the in the opening, changes the the landscape. Have a minute. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> Doctor Mechanic. Fuster, can I just say one thing about that? That. As, as you mentioned, it was 2008 when the FDA mandated yeah. adjudication of those events. Prior to that, none of this was being adjudicated. So it may very well be that it's the first time we actually looked at those events and showed an improvement. And who knows if previously it was happening as well. Yeah, that's a good point. Dr. Mechanic, there's something very peculiar here. We have, and I agree, this is the most important advance, and you agree too, I'm sure. But it's interesting because they work well for microvascular disease. They work well for macrovascular disease, and the whole issue is glucose, but probably that has nothing to do with the glucose effect. Is this by chance? What in the world happened here? So it was focused on glucose, and it works through different mechanisms. Right, so um, one of the trends in clinical practice guidelines has been to move, I'm watching the clock, so. One of the trends uh, in clinical practice guidelines has been to migrate away from a glucose-centric explanation that links type 2 diabetes with cardiovascular disease. In fact, care needs to be comprehensive, and it includes residual risk factors. It includes new definitions of obesity, which relate to adiposity-based chronic disease, the distribution, and also the abnormal function of adipocytes. And also the recognition that type 2 diabetes actually begins much earlier than where we detect it in the clinical setting. So a lot of those errors are propagated and give rise to this gap you're alluding to. Uh, Dr. Moliterno, David, do you, when you look at diabetes from your point of view of working in the cath lab, is this where you are most excited about the medications or you are excited about something else? Uh, I, I would say something else. Uh, back to the question you asked Steve, is, is, is maybe it's my concern. Maybe I'm getting older. Maybe it's from living in Kentucky. But this is really serious, what's happened to our population. I, I liken it to the 1950s and 1960s when tobacco use began to flourish in the U.S. and how you know, women shifted from you know, breast cancer to lung cancer being number one. And so in Kentucky, we are usually top at something beyond basketball. <laughs> And that's obesity and diabetes. In fact, the rate of diabetes as a diagnosis has doubled in the last 10 years in my state. Not gone up a little, doubled. And so my biggest concern is as terrific we can get all these newfangled drugs, which will take time and will exert an effect. But what I'm greatly concerned about is the obesity I'm seeing in younger and younger and younger people 
and how that's going to affect us going forward. So that's yeah. what I think the biggest issue is. It's a big emphasis. Actually, let me go back to you, Jeff, um, about a second aspect I want to touch into, because I think it's important. It's about the mechanisms of what really uh, actually happened. It, it, it is complex, but at least I can summarize, and you correct me, about the what really is happening here. Well, let's start with obesity, OK? And what obesity does is uh, there are these deposits of fat in different parts of the body, and particularly in the peritoneum is an area that is quite sensitive. And then it is my understanding that um, macrophages decide to clean the area, and the macrophages get there. They get exhausted, and when they get exhausted, they begin to release bad things like uh, the um, uh, pro-inflammatory adipokinins and so forth. And then what these pro-inflammatory adipokinins do, and again, I am simplifying a very complex subject, is they actually block the receptor for insulin. Now, before I go any further, I want, one thing I want to understand, uh, if this is correct, you block the receptor of insulin uh, first of all, is glucagon involved that receptor? Just a moment. Second, is the insulin in blood increases? And third, relatively speaking, is the secretion of insulin from the pancreas decreasing? You, you, you understand? In other words, because when you go into monitoring all of this, as well, insulin is up, glucagon, you block it, and it's a great therapy. So um, what I'm writing is at that point, when the receptor is blocked, what about glucagon? What about the insulin? secretion by the pancreas, and what about the level of insulin in blood? So we're looking at physiologic, pathophysiologic drivers of the uh, type 2 diabetes state. So insulin resistance is a very early event. Um, it probably is a result of some abnormal adiposity, obesity as an inflammatory condition. So you start with the genetic, genomic, environmental risk factors, you then have some abnormality and adiposity, and it may not be the BMI. It may be abnormal distribution of body fat, and that abnormal fat distribution contributes to the inflammatory state. You then uh, give rise to insulin resistance, and now your point is you don't have uh, dependent uh, events. You now have some other uh, independent events. One of them is glucagon, although there are uh, some uh, paracrine effects of alpha and beta cells and delta cells communicating in the pancreas. But it is really an independent effect with this hyperglucagonemia, and that's how GLP-1s really act by lowering glucagon. The second thing is the beta cell defect. The beta cell defect is essentially what's defining that transition from insulin resistance, where you have normoglycemia, to prediabetes slash type 2 diabetes, where you have dysglycemia or abnormal glycemic state. And then um, the third thing is, yes, with insulin resistance, you get this rise in serum insulin levels. And that's the reason why a beta cell defect becomes important, because the lack of that ability to compensate is what eventually gives rise to the hyperglycemia. But it's a, uh, it's a relative increase in secretion, but it's not getting into the receptor. Correct. OK, that's what I wanted to understand. Now, the, the next steps, uh, you know, you, it's interesting the fact that uh, obviously glucose goes up because it's not getting into the cell. And then glucose affects the mitochondria, something quite interesting. Um, in affecting the mitochondria, you have DNA damage. You have a metabolic process it actually leads to the end products and inflammation. So, uh, and this leads to atherosclerotic disease in every respect. So, uh, it's just to point out, maybe to, to emphasize here, that obesity is a huge problem when we talk about diabetes. And we cannot talk about diabetes without approaching obesity. This is why we are going to talk later about bariatric surgery and a number of things that really have the, the highest impact into what appears to be a metabolic pathways, and then you end up doing surgery to abolish, which is amazing. Well, having said that, let's now move into 
an interesting area, which is the risk factors that actually are affecting or are concomitant with the diabetes, which we talk about lipids. Uh, we'll talk about omega-3, as you mentioned. And, uh, and so we will talk about the, um, the, the, the PCSK9 inhibitors for a moment and so, and, and so forth. So last, uh, I think last month, we had uh, another controversy here, which was about the issue of the new guidelines of how we manage lipids, how we should manage lipids. And I want to just summarize for a second what, we, uh, what was discussed, is that is the new guidelines are saying that, in effect, in, a, in addressing the issue of this lipoproteinemia, in particular hyperlipidemia, we have six different approaches. The first one is in children between age 20 and 39 years and in the elderly. And the answer from the guidelines is very frustrating. There is no answer because there is no data. Number two are patients, the most of the population between 14 and 75 years, that um, actually um, they do not have uh, atherosclerotic disease or cardiovascular disease. And the question is, here's where you use uh, all these uh, formulas, you know, and you go into a risk of 10 years, better 30 years, but, and then you can into the calcium score and you decide if you place the individual on the statins or not. Number three is coronary artery disease. The patient has coronary artery disease and the question is, what do you do with the statins? This is the issue. And what you do is you drop the LDL cholesterol levels to at least 50% of the original level. And if the risk factors associated with coronary disease are very significant, you drop the level into aim of 70 milligrams DL. This is chronic coronary artery disease. What is fascinating, this is exactly what you do with diabetes. Basically, a diabetic patient should be on statins. And the question is, what do you do regardless of the level you drop it to 50%. And if there are many risk factors, you drop it even less than 70% because is a coronary artery disease equivalent. So this is the fourth issue. And then we talk about what happens with patients with a very high risk of atherosclerotic disease, coronary syndromes, and so forth, and, and finally, familial hypercholesterolemia. So it's just to emphasize that a diabetic patient should be treated with the statins right away. Today, uh, Jeff, we have a lot of so-called pre-diabetics. The typical individual with a borderline blood sugar, hemoglobin A1C around seven. You call pre-diabetic, would you treat that individual with the statins? So, independent of guidelines, I would. Um, although I'm not sure that concept's ready for prime time yet. I, I think that we need to, and I think eventually five years hence, we're gonna be, be, be more aggressive with intervention earlier on in the natural history of uh, dysglycemia and the natural history of type two diabetes. In fact, I think you could, you could make an argument to envision insulin resistance, prediabetes, type two diabetes and vascular disease all as yeah. one metabolic disorder. Yeah. Therefore, the earlier intervention, the better. Although that doesn't necessarily mean pharmacotherapy, very aggressive lifestyle well, intervention treat obesity. might suffice. We are talking about, yeah. Roxana, you mentioned uh, something interesting, but um, I want to follow this through. Omega-3 fatty acids, uh, you know, have not have a, a good report thus far, uh, too many fluctuations over the years into what they mean. But the reduced trial was quite fascinating. And I just tried to mention nearly 8,000 patients, actually 60% had diabetes and had, they had high triglycerides. And this uh, kind of omega-3 fatty acid manufactured by industry uh, actually was able to make a significant reduction of events independent of the triglyceride levels. So in fact, the conclusions were that we have uh, a new type of agent, the so-called icosapent ethyl, who actually can have a significant effect in patients who actually have high triglycerides, 
but also in patients with diabetes. And this has nothing to do with the triglyceride level. So I'd like just to comment, and I will ask you, Jeff, again, uh, to give uh, your view about this. I think the REDUCA trial was a, an extraordinary study that uh, with the use of this agent at a high dose, we were able to uh, unequivocally reduce uh, important heart endpoints, cardiovascular endpoints uh, in patients. And uh, they had a high, a high risk uh, group in there, you know, with 60% diabetics, high, you know, regardless of what the triglyceride or the uh, levels were. So I think for sure we are revisiting this in the past, I was not uh, a believer, but I think after this study, um, I'm uh, I'm definitely changed my mind. I don't know what other people are are doing, but I'm certainly considering it. Uh, but I have to say, I also believe that the LDL plays a very very important role in this patient population, and I'm very very aggressive in reducing the LDL below 50, especially in any diabetic patient. The ones we see have had already have had coronary disease or some revascularization. And driving that number down is incredibly important. And then, of course, you mentioned inflammation. So I think we have to think about these patients into four buckets. The bucket of the thromboembolic risk, the bucket of inflammatory risk, the lipid risk, and the fourth one is the glucose risk. Even though you are moving away a lot from the glucose itself, I think we've got to think about these four components in these patients. Okay, thank you. It's interesting new drug, actually, or new approach. Uh, the, the interesting aspect of that is patients uh, did not have coronary artery disease. They had just uh, high triglycerides, and that's all. But most of them were diabetics. I think that's a critical issue. Uh, well, let's let's move, uh, Jeff. Let's let's jump into the PCSK9 inhibitors. I never. Uh, every time I think about PCSK9 and all these receptors, I never know what he's doing. But you know, I I, I have a a formula that says PCSK9 means the P for police. Police means doesn't allow the cholesterol to get into the liver. That's it, in the receptor. So what you do is you inhibit it, and the cholesterol gets in, and the levels go down. Now, we have two studies. Uh, the, as you know, the Fourier study, the Odyssey Outcomes Study, all very significant in terms of events. And I don't want to go into too much detail, but the question is how many of these patients all having coronary artery disease and high, high um, uh, levels of uh, LDL, how many of these patients were diabetics? Actually, 30%. So when you look at the data of PCSK9 inhibitors uh, in, uh, as a possibility uh, to address the lipid profile, there is no good data on diabetics. And I think this is uh, one issue that all of us uh, actually should be aware. Any comments, uh, Jeff? Well, this gets back to your point indirectly. Would I treat patients who had prediabetes as aggressively? So the fact that they were 30%, is that really the population that ultimately we're going to want to treat with uh, preventive medicine? Uh, and I think patients who have prediabetes, who have a lot of other strong risk factors, are going to be as deservant of these aggressive interventions, though we don't really have the data to support that right now. It seems that the PCSK9 are not there yet in the diabetic population. Now, hypertension, Dr. Dangas, I don't know what is your experience. No, in treating hypertension, which is also associated with uh, obesity and diabetes, um, I'm very, uh, how can I put it, very skeptical about these inhibitors. And I have to say, this is a personal experience when you treat uh, hypertension in terms of what you achieve in the lowering of hypertension. And actually, when you go to the trials, it seems that these inhibitors or the receptor blockers are not having the impact that other drugs have in the, in the field of hypertension. Now, but here in the diabetic population, it has been proven in four trials, the HOPE, the EUROPE, the LIFE, and and the sprint, no, because everybody talks about diabetes in a sprint. A sprint didn't enter diabetic patients. These drugs appear to be the best. Uh, is this your experience? That is, if you have a diabetic patient with hypertension, what the data tends to show that the best agents to be given, may, because maybe because of the kidney, are actually the, um, 
ACE inhibitors followed by the receptor blockers? Well, I, I think both are true. Uh, first of all, I rarely use monotherapy. Therefore, uh, you know, if perhaps I don't perform very well alone, um, it's probably true. I, I would accept that. But uh, um, I think they definitely have to be a part of the combination of therapy for hypertension and diabetics because of all these other prognostically important factors that they affect. Plus, I think they're a good add-on drug in the, in the, in the cocktail. Okay, uh, in, it's interesting, at least the, the guidelines uh, that just came out about the use of uh, agents in, in patients with hypertension and diabetes is you should drop the blood pressure below 130 over 80, not below 120, like in the SPRINT trial. Because as you know, there is some data, probably because the microcirculation, that you might decrease perfusion and have trouble with the patient. Uh, um, Jeff, you agree with that? Be a little cautious in the dropping of blood pressure in diabetes. I mean, I'll be honest, I, I still don't have a firm uh, grip on one versus the, versus the other. I've heard this debate over and over again, um, and I, I really can't say that 130 over 80 is better than 120 over 80 uh, for patients with diabetes. I, I would say it needs to be individualized and I would refrain from imposing a blanket rule. Okay, okay David, uh, you may say you're in the reserve. Remember, in the Barcelona soccer club, when Messi comes out, everything changes. So <laughs> the time that you're asked questions doesn't go uh, in parallel with your knowledge. You talk about obesity, and let me get into that. Now, one of the best studies in obesity actually was just published, and that is how people lose weight. And I think this is a fascinating Canadian study, very difficult to do, but it was done in 1,000 individuals with a, a BMI that was an average of 32. And what they did is everybody had a guide of how to lose weight. But then, in addition, in one group, they were calling every week. In the other group, they actually delivered the food that they should take. So the, they divided the groups in a way that you are at home and you have, you don't have to do anything, you just receive and you, you do it. Results, terrible. <laughs> terrible. And that is uh, very small benefits. The, the results, by the way, the results at six months were reasonable. You lose three, four kilograms, but certainly you don't drop the BMI significantly. And at 12 months, it seems nothing has happened. Now, with this in mind, we all talk about diets and so forth, and we are dealing with the key issue of diabetes. So uh, I'd like to have your opinion uh, about what you think about it. Certainly it's quite uh, frustrating. Well, I, I guess if, if you're looking for the secret to losing weight, uh, I don't know, maybe we call Dr. Oz, see what he thinks. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we'd, we'd all be wealthy, right? I think that numerous people have tried uh, n numerous strategies to get to lose weight. Certainly there are possible ways to do it, uh, but it, it's, it's not durable, right? Some people have gone with Ornish, some people have gone with other aggressive strategies for weight loss, and I guess the challenge is its durability. Um, I do think something else is happening, though, societally, whether it's easier to get calories, like you described, having it delivered to your door, or if it's that we're not doing enough you know, exercise, but something is clearly shifting our population uh, substantially and dramatically. Dr. Dangas, following uh, what David is talking about, you know, in the Freedom Trial, the Courage Trial, the Body 2 d Trial, of all the diabetic patients, only 20% follow the rules. You know, the rules were take the medication you have to take, lose weight, and treat your blood pressure, only 20%. So what we are going to do? I mean... We are dealing that there is an epidemic. If anybody talks about an epidemic today, you already know it's obesity and diabetes. That's what really is the killer. And I don't know what we are doing. Yeah, well, it's a fact of the matter that uh, the uh, long-term medical therapy is not exactly adhered to as well as we all fantasize. Uh, and uh, um, uh, we need a, a little bit more of a society-based, lifestyle-driven uh, initiatives in order to... Uh, go out there and, and make happen the population-based decreases in weight and diabetes and blood pressure. 
Uh, it's just not going to happen by prescribing medications. Uh, it, it will not. Um, when you see all the promotions of all the wrong things left and right, uh, just the mass of people, the numbers of people that are really responding to that and become massive, then that's really a, a problem to control it with just some prescription drugs that are often expensive and, you know, they're associated also with uh, some side effects to many people. Um, so I think the more we, we go towards society-based, broader um, uh, principles of uh, healthy living and healthy lifestyle, uh, it's going to be difficult. Yeah, let, let, me, let, me push, uh, David, let me push back to you, though, Dr. Fuster. Uh, as I recollect, and you know the data far better than I do, in freedom, I think the BMI was between 29 and 30, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's not very attractive. And, and my recollection is, and Jeff, you, you may remember better than I, but it seems in follow-up, their LDLs were near 100. Uh, maybe somewhere in the 90s. So I'm wondering if we're failing too with our patients if yeah. we can't get their LDLs down, you know, down low enough, right? Well, let me let me go since you're an interventionalist. Let's talk about bariatric surgery for a moment, David. Uh, as you know, we are, we are dealing with a procedure that six years ago or ten years ago we laugh about it and we were very worried it was not going to be something that we were going to be able to control. Well, we have gastric banding, as you know, it's leaf gastrectomy, you, you, you reduce the stomach size, or you have a bypass of the stomach. Now, the results began in the Cleveland Clinic, uh, where you were one of the people there, and they began to do the studies in not many people, 150, 200, but they began to gather information that hemoglobin A1C was decreasing from seven, eight to six, for example, they began to see that the weight was significantly decreasing, a BMI by about 10%. I tell you the original data. Uh, they saw actually about 20% to 30% of people with diabetes, the diabetes being complete control. Uh, they saw, and on and on and off, I could go over all this data. To me, this was fascinating, and this was the beginning of an era today there are already randomized studies, certainly three very well randomized studies, and the results really support what I'm talking about. Some people will say about complications. Let me tell you about the complications. The complications in the studies that I just published, which are prospective studies in bariatric surgery versus medical treatment, uh, there is um, uh, an incident rate of sepsis between 0 0.1 and 5.6%, bleeding, 1% to 4% at the time of surgery. Cardiopulmonary um, difficulties, 0.3 to 1.3%. Mortality, 0.1 uh, to 0.3%. Uh, so, frankly, it seems to me we have a partial answer. Obesity and diabetes. And now we'll go into what the guidelines say, but I'd just like to, your reaction, David. Well, I don't know. My, my reaction may be not polite. I, th I think it's pathetic if we need to, you know, perform an operation on someone to get them to, to lose weight, to take better control of their, their health. I, sure, can we do it? I, I'm sure we can. Could we wire their jaw shut? Yeah, I'm sure we can. But I, 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 I dislike this from a societal yeah. perspective that we, I think it's Koch's postulate being tested, sure. You can give me a patient, I can make them fat and show that things go wrong, and I can make them skinny and show that it goes away, and then I can follow them for years and watch those that break through and it comes back again. So I think that I can prove it's cause and effect, but I dislike the idea personally of, of You know the, the follow-up is eight years now on the three studies. Eight years of follow-up, so, and the weight reduction is maintained, uh, Jeff? Well, actually, SOS, we have followed over 20 years uh, for bariatric surgery. L let me just uh, chime in here. So I, I've chaired the bariatric surgery guidelines in 2008-2013, and we're um, completing our 2018 guidelines now with five different societies co-sponsoring, including anesthesia. Uh, what's new now in bariatric surgery are ERABs, uh, enhanced recovery after bariatric surgery, metabolic surgery, which is Francesco Rubino's uh, 
uh, sort of baby, and we have our conference coming up uh, in another month on metabolic surgery actually here in New York. Um, and the way in which bariatric surgery, the way you would balance the yin and the yang of bariatric surgery where the, the emotion is that we shouldn't as a society be resorting to these procedures. But on, on the other hand, and I think Dr. Fuster, this is what you're alluding to, it's really the only intervention that has this durable effect at the threshold that you want for amelioration of all of these cardiovascular risk factors. How do you balance the two? And the answer is you need to restructure the clinical decision tree, the algorithm. You need to select your patients better. The patients that are in these bariatric surgery registries are contaminated by patients who should probably never have had them. And a lot of patients who should have bariatric surgery are marginalized, are excluded from this life-saving necessary procedure. So we as a society need to do the following. First, at a local and state level, we need better legislation for health, for better health. Second, we need better algorithms that are evidence-based. And thirdly, we need better implementation tools so that we can apply these algorithms in a fair, equitable way to patients who are in need. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me go into the guidelines of one of the organizations you belong, the International Diabetes Organization. It just came out with uh, the outline of what could be done in a diabetic to patient. Now, you know, obesity is uh, class one, two, or three, and this has to do with the BMI. It's, uh, I think it's from 30 to 35 is class one obesity. 35 to 40 is class two in more than 40s, class three. If you have a diabetic patient with uh, class three, bariatric surgery is indicated if everything is right. If you have a patient with class one or class two and uh, there's difficulty in controlling the glycemia, this patient should be considered for bariatric surgery. This is just came out from the International Diabetes Association. Uh, you are in agreement with that? I think you were part of this, actually. You, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, th that's just consensus. There, there's nothing sexy about those uh, recommendations. And in my view, they're not modern. Mm -hmm. um, they fail to recognize the transcultural effects that, for instance, in South Asians and Southeast Asians, you have abnormal distribution, you have sarcopenic obesity, you have an Asian Indian uh, phenotype, uh, and it just fails to take that into account. And also, the BMI-centric uh, clinical decision-making has categorically failed us. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, the other aspect about the uh, bariatric surgery is the impact on atrial fibrillation, which we have discussed before, and the impact in heart failure, actually in the prevention. So it's interesting. It's, it's hard to talk about this. It's like when we talk about the polypill. Is the polypill an answer to people not taking pills? You feel bad about it. It's like a cosmetic approach to life when you don't have anything else to do, but it's a real issue. Roxana, one of the aspects in, uh, in risk factors that affect the diabetic patient, uh, we didn't mention, but it's thrombogenesis. And actually, Juan Badimon, I think, is here, and he contributed a lot to that. And, and here's the story about the antiplatelet therapy for primary prevention of cardiovascular disease in diabetic patients. There are four trials already. You remember the first was in Japan. It was, yeah, it was published in 2016. It was a great study that really got into the news. These were about 2,500 Japanese with type 2 diabetes. They were actually randomized in aspirin, 100 milligrams, and placebo for a period of 10 years. Aspirin did not affect the risk for cardiovascular events, but increased the risk for GI bleeding. This was the first study. And I still remember people writing, this is wrong, the Japanese have not done the right thing, and so forth. But now there are three studies just published in the last two years. The ASCEN trial, the ARRIVE trial, and the ASPRI trial, all showing the same thing. So aspirin for primary prevention, uh, according to the most recent guidelines of the American Diabetes Association, uh, is not recommended except if there is a significant increased risk factor profile associated with the diabetes. What do you think? No, I, I mean, I think that uh, these data with four trials now going against uh, aspirin really question the use of 
aspirin across the board. But just today, uh, it was announced the Themis trial, which is, uh, I think, um, 10,000 or so diabetic patients with coronary disease. I think they had coronary disease. Uh, showed uh, they met their primary endpoint. We'll see what that data is. Ticagrelor aspirin versus aspirin alone with superiority of ticagrelor plus aspirin. So it's going to be interesting to see what that looks like, Dr. Fuster. Okay, well, um, we are entering now into a new chapter, which is the pharmacology of diabetes. And, and actually, in general, we are talking about diabetic patients who already have coronary artery disease. But um, let me start uh, with you, Jeff, about uh, one issue that uh, we talk about, is uh, intense approach to the diabetic patient versus less intense approach to the diabetic patient. I only will tell you what we learned, and I think Steve made a very good summary of this. First of all, metformin seems to do something in macrovascular disease. Uh, on the other hand, you have to give it very early in the course, and, and it works, it may work without established cardiovascular disease. So, uh, but otherwise, without talking about the new agents, it seems to me we don't have anything that can prevent cardiovascular events today. And let, let's, let's talk for a moment about metformin, which could be perhaps the first drug of choice uh, on the diabetic patient. What do you think? So this is a controversy um, which is going to be settled within the next couple of years, which is should metformin continue to occupy that position of first-line therapy for patients with type 2 diabetes and even pre-diabetes and polycystic ovary syndrome. And bearing in mind that the reason it's there is because it's cheap, I mean, a dollar or less a pill, really, it's cheap. And also, the side effect profile is acceptable. But if you look at uh, primary prevention from uh, DPP of uh, 38%, TZDs were 70% in uh, decreasing the, the type 2 diabetes. So it's not the best drug for primary prevention. And there are other drugs that are even better for weight control, which is addressing the adiposity, the true driver for type 2 diabetes, and we're just encumbered because of the cost and the accessibility and the disparities of accessibility of some of these other agents. So right now, metformin is first line, but it, it probably, once the cost gets balanced out and, the, and pharma changes uh, the equilibrium of a lot of these costs, I think you're going to see it slip. Uh, we're almost on the verge in our diabetes algorithm of putting other drugs equivalent to metformin as first-line therapy. Okay, let's talk for a moment about these uh, wonderful two drugs, types of drugs. The one is the glucagon-like peptide one receptor agonist, which uh, is supposed to promote insulin secretion and suppressing glucagon, and then with effects in gastric emptying and so forth. And that can be good to decrease the appetite because of the gastric effect. What is interesting is when you go to the literature, it seems they are wonders. When you go to the trials, there is only one that really shows some imp significant improvement. And I want to tell you, the, 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 well, the leader trial with liraglutide, the sustained six semaglutide, the Excel with exenatide, and elixir, lixinetide. Now, if I go to the data that I have available here, the, actually, there was some reduction in cardiovascular events with the LEADER trial. There was nothing with the EXCEL trial. There was um, something with the sustained six trial, but nothing else. So my question to you is, are people more excited about the way these drugs work than really with the data. I just want to be very sure, because people use this to reduce weight, for example, glutarite. But what else is we are having with these drugs, this group of drugs? So the class is very effective if you're also targeting adiposity. But bear in mind that what determines our selection of drugs nowadays is not 
all of this nuance and theory. It's the insurance companies. It, it's which, in, which drug will be paid for by that patient's particular insurance plan. And we just don't have enough data yet to know whether there's class effects because of these subtle differences in the populations being studied. Um, it turns out that semaglutide probably has more of an effect, more of a beneficial effect on the adiposity component. And That's even though sustain six didn't show as much on CBD, it's probably there. Plus, oral semaglutide is coming out, and you're going to start seeing these GLP-1 receptor agonists um, in, in implantable uh, formats where they're lasting for three months at a time. But it's the first line. example that you are addressing obesity, not necessarily the diabetes by itself. Right. And this is interesting because the way it is portrayed by me, by industry, is a marketing, that this is a fantastic drug for diabetes. Well, uh, Roxana and, and, and George, are you using the other drugs, sodium glucose transporter to inhibitors? You know, these drugs, as you know, uh, what they do is they block the receptors in the, in the urinary tract, and then glucosuria mm -hmm. and, uh, and sodium get out, and so in a way, you decrease the glycemia and you decrease volume also in the, in the circulation. Are you using these drugs? I like metformin. <laughs> you always are a classic. That's why you come from Greece. <laughs> metformin all the way. It's very cheap, very compliant, and I get the chance to refer for advanced uh, risk factor modification to Dr. Mechanic or Dr. Rosenson, and they do a great job. <laughs> but if you go to a board exam and the question comes in, you will flunk. So, I mean, I think obviously the data on the SGLT2 uh, receptor inhibitors are incredibly great for reduction of cardiovascular events. And when I have a diabetic patient, when they come to us, they're, they have coronary disease, they've just had a PCI. So, of course, I want them to be at the best possible way to reduce their events, and then I do send them to... Uh, you know, to you or to Elise, actually, <laughs> for making sure that they're uh, on these agents. I do believe that these trials are, are very, very impressive. Very impressive. And uh, yeah. I think that it's metformin is going to be out there, out of there, and I think we're going to move towards these drugs. And what is interesting, <laughs> what is interesting about the trials, do you know how many trials I, I just... Uh, uh, there are 16 trials going on with these new agents. But what is fascinating is that whatever happens to the patient in terms of cardiovascular events probably has nothing to do with the mechanism that we talk about it. Yeah. Uh, maybe the volume decretion may be less problematic for the cardiovascular system. But uh, now, as you know, there are three trials in heart failure in the prevention and in treatment of heart failure. It has nothing to do with diabetic patients. So it's, it's, it's fascinating, the field of pharmacology in diabetes. But anyway, um, now we are moving more into the field of a screening and intervention. And uh, here you have a statement, my friend, that screening for coronary artery disease in patients with diabetes you state they were going to the literature and so forth. It is probably not worth it. Well, um, there are two issues here, and I'd like to ask David about his opinion. Uh, first of all, it's true that the studies done with imaging, uh, exercise functional imaging and CT, have not shown an improvement in cost effectiveness of one versus the other at least in the studies that were published uh, some in the last three or four years. However, uh, new studies are coming out, in particular in diabetic patients, which actually, because probably are patients with coronary artery disease that are more, is more significant, in which CT is actually the winner. I can go into some details. The, the study that was just published, one of two studies, it was just published actually in, in Jack about three months ago, which is a stress testing versus CT angiography in patients with diabetes and suspected coronary artery disease. And it's fascinating how the use of CT angiography as the first testing led to better results because you move, but most importantly, a higher use of drugs that are suspected are important for coronary disease. Once you see in an angiogram, 
that the disease is there and is significant. So, David, I want to ask you, um, frankly, I was always sensitized to a patient with diabetes, and I always tried to figure out if that patient had coronary artery disease, and this may be controversial, but the issue of CT angiography is coming from many sides as a possibility, and I'd like to hear your views. Well, um, my views, again, maybe coming from Kentucky are, are, are not dissimilar from, you know, the bariatric surgery. I, I think that's ex expensive tests, and I'd rather probably just take that money and treat patients uh, aggressively than, than, than to spend it on imaging. I think that the only thing that might help me is how soon to start aggressive therapy, because I think most patients with diabetes are likely going to die of ischemic heart disease, and so that's not a question of then do they get treated, it's when and how aggressively should they be treated. I guess if there's some, you know, caution, you know, maybe if they've got liver insufficiency or they've got, you know, multiple side effects from drugs, you know, kind of like when we used to measure CRP and say, oh, maybe they don't need it, but I, I'm not sure why I wouldn't treat a diabetic and why I would need a cardiac CT to push me one way or the other. Well, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting, but this is what we do. I think if you know that there's something going on, you are more prone to treat it. This is the PROMISE study, by the way. We are talking about an important, a very large study that they would just publish the overall data. And what they found is the diabetic population there was no question. There was a significant uh, hazard ratio in favor of CT angiography as the first yeah. test other than function. George? Well, I believe that because also we know that in, <clears throat> in diabetes there's a lot of uh, silent CAD. So uh, the CT not only does it enforces the, uh, the compliance, which it does. It was everybody takes more drugs, the doctors more reliably, I should say, the doctors prescribe more aggressively higher doses, which is another story regarding the medical therapy, the underdosing. But at the same time, you pick up so much silent CAD. And uh, uh, study after study have indicated that although silent CAD may be very convenient for the patient, they have no symptoms, it's actually prognostically very adverse from however you want to look at it. So that's another benefit uh, of, the, of, the, of the CT, like uh, that multi there are multiple layers you have a benefit in these high-risk populations. The negative you have is that you are, you know, the patients may, with some renal failure or other aspects, may get side effect to the, um, uh, to the, to the CT. But, uh, you know, I don't think that's, a, that's good enough and it's sufficiently rare that we should probably not uh, overemphasize that. Well, the, the, the trial, what it showed, is the most important, uh, the most important variable leading to the improvement was a significant increase in medication intake. Exactly. Once you identify that you have diabetes and coronary artery disease, that was basically what the paper showed. So it's something to actually take into account. Uh, we are now beginning to get into the interventional field, uh, non-pharmacological field. And um, in one of the issues, two, two issues are, are in, of interest. One is patients we have who have uh, acute coronary syndromes. Uh, what is the best intervention uh, when there is significant uh, vascular disease of stenting versus, uh, versus bypass? And the other are patients in heart failure and decreased ejection fraction. So I can, only, I can only comment on that in terms of the patients with acute coronary syndromes, in the Freedom trial, 30% of the patients had a recent acute coronary syndrome. This is within two to three months but were not acute in the sense that we talk usually. But there is a study in Canada uh, that was just published, actually Michael Farku is one of the authors, in which they look at patients with acute coronary syndrome. And actually, um, I think it was a retrospective study, 4,000 diabetic patients, and they found uh, cabbage uh, superior to PCI over a short period of time. And Roxana, do you know of this study? Yeah, I know that it's a retrospective Canadian um, data that is um, has a lot of bias, possibility of yeah. bias, and 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 it needs to be uh, left to the interpretation of a prospective study. I think in the setting of an acute coronary syndrome, um, we are for the most part diabetic or not no diabetes. We're treating the culprit vessel, and the big question yeah. is if the if they have multi vessel disease, how to how to handle those, and the complete trial, 
which just completed enrollment, we were actually on the executive committee meeting today, um, basically will hopefully be showing those data. We have about 45% uh, acute, uh, I mean these are uh, STEMI and ACS patients uh, with multivessel disease where they're getting a, um, a randomization to uh, complete versus uh, waiting to see, and, and cabbage is in there as well for the complete revascularization. And most of those patients are undergoing PCI, and about 45% diabetic patients are included in that. So I think it's going to be interesting to see what do we do for diabetes. Should we be thinking? I think your question is a very good one. Is an ACS patient should, who is diabetic, should we be treating them different than others? And I would say no. I would say you need to go fast and quickly with the culprit vessel, and most of them in diabetic patients, they could have, maybe and then eventually yeah, think about think what to do good, next. It's a good point. Now, um, we talk about, we are getting into intervention, and we said that from the medical point of view, uh, we talk a lot about the risk factor modification. I purposely didn't talk about insulin. And the question is, Dr. Mechanic, why I didn't talk about insulin? So the issues with insulin are, if, if you look at, if you borrow or extend the results from advanced VADT and Accord, um, it, in ACS, there, is, there are some data that indicate that too much or too intensive insulinization can be adverse. There are also data that you need to have this tight control. And then in the context of freedom and and the healing and the regenerative uh, function of the endothelium, what is the role of insulin on endothelial action and also the reperfusion injury salvage kinase pathway? So here would be my answer. I don't think this is an issue of ambient glucose control or insulinization. I think this is an issue of glycemic variability. And in order to arrive at that conclusion, I borrow a lot of the data and information from the ICU, critical illness, and intensive insulin therapy, where it's really glycemic variability and these periodic, this incidence of hypoglycemia. Each episode of hypoglycemia seems to have a, a negative predictive effect on outcome. So by managing the glycemic variability, that should be the focus. And there is a pragmatic aspect to this. In the outpatient setting, for instance, at 85th Street, we are putting on continuous glucose monitors and Libres on a lot more patients nowadays, and I think that's what we're going to see in the future. Well, there are two questions. George Danger showed that in the Freedom Trial, uh, patients on insulin did worse, but it's not only in the Freedom Trial. There's in many other trials. Why? Yeah. It's the hypoglycemia. You so, think that's the reason? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think when you look at all the post hoc analyses of these tight glycemic control protocols, it's the incident rate, the frequency, and the degree and the severity of the hypoglycemia. And in addition, the glycemic variability. You can, if you look at the Krinsky data, um, or if you look at some of the, the more recent um, data that were in diabetes care just this year, um, whether glycemic variability is in terms of uh, median amplitude of glycemic excursion, uh, jackknife entropy, or standard deviation, so, or we actually published this study in the respiratory cluster that just the range of the uh, glycemic excursion. So let me ask you, what, what is our, yeah, just a moment, what is our objective of giving insulin? Just a moment. If we go into the, da the data, cardiovascular events are not modified, in fact, are increased. So you, you, you give insulin to, to prevent uh, coma? Do you give insulin to, why we are giving insulin? Just give us a sense what we are doing. The answer is we don't have the answer yet. That's the answer. The answer is that the studies are flawed because they're looking at individual metrics for insulinization and they haven't yet come up with what, what I believe to be the correct metric, which is a composite metric of sort of the different moments. It's, it's the average. It's the glycemic variability. It's also the levels of insulin in the bloodstream. Insulin itself um, is, is atherogenic. So it, it's really a measure of all three of those things. And those studies just haven't been done. Yeah. 
Okay, so let's go into stable coronary artery disease. And, and this is where my friend Steve last night was telling it was a great controversy, and I call him on an emergency basis where he got this from. Very basically, the very, the very trial, the syntax trial with high syntax score, the cardiac trial all showed that bypass surgery was superior to medical, to um, uh, PCI or medical therapy uh, in all the studies. The Freedom trial had the advantage, it was the only one prospectively addressing the issue of, um, of cabbage versus uh, stenting in near 2,000 patients. And actually, I can say that one of the issues interesting in the Freedom trial is the results were very significant in terms of the number of events uh, in the three-year follow-up, three to four-year follow-up, but the mortality had a p-value of being decreased in cabbage versus stenting of 0 0.049. We decided not to make a big issue, but was already significant. What is interesting is that eight years of follow-up, the, the difference uh, between in difference in terms of mortality is from 18% in in the uh, in the cabbage group versus 23% five points, and here uh, with these five points of difference, the debate that you mentioned is because the stents are improving, but the stents are not improving mortality. You just David showed it this morning, even no no improvement in myocardial infarction. The new generation of stents have not touched this issue. So that's why I don't think this is a controversy. Controversy can be at a different level. The elderly population, you can do lots of things, but not at the level of better stenting. So what is your opinion? And then I will ask you, Roxana, because you are very anxious to say something. Well, I, I, I think that um, in this regard, bypass surgery has never been a loser. Never. I, I can't think of one study where it frankly lost among diabetic patients. The question is, is are we narrowing that gap and by how much? But I, I don't know from Barry forward, you, you not to stand on my soapbox, but it's still my concern whether looking at Barry or Freedom or any of these studies, I still think we have not done a service to the patient if we come back months or years later and their LDL or their glucose or all these nice things we're talking about isn't improved. I mean, sure, we fixed the blockage at the moment, but. And then we kind of got, got kind of got lost in it. Uh, you know, I, I wrote an editorial, I think, for the five-year Barry trial, and I I, I, I said, y you know, have have we won the fight but lost the argument? You know, we we kind of missed the point. And so, anyway, we'll hear from Roxana. She can be more down to earth than I can. No, I, I no, I I think you're you're 100 percent correct. Obviously, with bypass surgery, with bypass, we are bypassing the entire vessel and kind of hopefully protecting the patient, especially with the Lima to the LAD, and our surgeon isn't here, protecting that patient against uh, a catastrophic new lesion that can occur in that LAD anterior wall, et cetera. And so it could be not at all related to the stent whatsoever. But I think what we're say seeing now over and over again, that in the diabetic patients, our progress with next generation DES biodegradable polymer, et cetera, we haven't made the impact that we have done in non-diabetic patients. We've shown this. Uh, Usman Babur has a paper on women where we showed that all of the benefit of second generation DES is in the non-diabetics and actually in the diabetic patients. We're not seeing a progress. Hopefully you'll publish that. Uh, Dr. Um, Moriterno. But anyway, <laughs> so uh, I think it's in your journal. Uh, and then, uh, I, and I think what's happening now is that the metallic DES, next, uh, there is now new designs that are forming. There are two that we are working here at Mount Sinai with it. One is Envision Scientific, where they are actually spraying the drug after the balloon is, after the stent is crimped on the on the balloon, spraying the drug so that the balloon and the stent are getting the drug, so that everything is, uh, so there's a higher dosa dosage going in. And then there is a, another uh, amyphilous um, uh, uh, formulation that is amphilimus formulation of limus with, with a um, fatty acid formulation to give a higher dose to the wall. So there's a lot more newer 
generation, next generation, fourth generation DES for stent-related complications. So finally, I'll say that what the worst thing we can do is to see a lesion and send a young diabetic quickly to surgery when we haven't taken care of all of the risk factor modifications and perhaps we could hopefully put in a, a good stent, go after the, um, uh, and, and preclude that young patient for later on when they actually do need a lot of uh, bypasses. So I, that's why I think we need to kind of individualize this. Well, uh, Steve, one of the critical issues is that all the studies, longer they are, and you review this, uh, better results one gets through a single approach. For example, in the STITCH trial, bypass surgery, heart failure, five years, no difference versus medical therapy, 10 years, significant difference. So we, it's a joke. We are all talking about follow-ups, two, three, four years, and, 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 and we are really wrong because what all the studies are showing is longer is the follow-up, better data you get or better information. Now, I'd just uh, like to, um, to perhaps uh, move, is that the surgeon is not here, John uh, Puskas is not here, unfortunately, but I'd like to make new, new to talk about a few new things uh, that I think are quite fascinating. Uh, the number one is the COMPASS trial, and you mentioned this, David, this at noon. The COMPASS trial, uh, you know, in patients, with coronary artery disease, straight coronary artery disease, in which the combination of rivaroxaban 2.5 milligrams twice daily plus aspirin significantly decreased the number of cardiovascular events compared with rivaroxaban alone or aspirin alone. But there was some increase in bleeding, but the increase in bleeding was one-fourth of the ischemic events that were actually Decrease and this led to the study in compass of the diabetic patients and uh, patients with cabbage, and was fascinating that the results continue to be very significant. So this opens the question of whether, in the diabetic and in the non-diabetic population, the combination of low dose rivaroxaban, at least in the way five milligrams twice daily, in aspirin have a future, if the bleeding risk is relatively small. This is a, an evolving. And I asked you this question, David, today, this morning. What do you think? It's a new approach, and it's fascinating, other than aspirin alone, coronary disease in general. Yeah, yeah no, I, th I think it is, it is fascinating. The question will be, is like with all these things as we dump in, whether it's the SGLT2 or the GLP-1, all these other inhibitors and control it, what will be left in the background? Uh, to reduce. I think when you and I talked at the European Society of Cardiology uh, last year, that was one of my in early interpretations of the primary prevention data, and aspirin showing no benefit is because we finally are aggressively treating some of the background risk factors, so there may be less residual benefit from uh, aggressive antithrombotic therapy. But I don't know, Roxana, somebody else has Roxana? No, I, I, uh, I think you're, you're right on there, but I think it's fascinating. The compass story is fascinating, and uh, whether some low level of anticoagulation, much like what you kind of thought about 30 years ago, is it 20 years ago with your that was with school, I mean, though. Yeah, uh, but no, but it's the concept is the same uh, in a way that is uh, maintaining a, a low level of anticoagulation that could have. I mean, there was 70% um, reduction in in limb loss and, uh, you know, limb-related amputations, <laughs> and especially with PVD, per peripheral arterial disease, which we know a lot of our diabetic patients have small vessel, chronic, uh, critical limb ischemia, et cetera. And I think, you know, we, we need to, as I said, I, I think we have to think about the diabetic patients' thrombotic risk just as high as their glycemic risk. Yeah. yeah David, um, oh, maybe uh, Steve. You as a fellow, you are not surprised. Study after study is coming out that you can do Lima, radial, radial artery, uh, with graft operations in which the whole thing is the arterial system. And only 5% of the surgeons in this country do bilateral Lima, uh, bilateral uh, internal mammary artery. Mm -hmm. What would you say? You are not amazed about that? I mean, I mean, I'm not sure I, I would uh, assume it's, a, it's an issue of expertise 
and uh, you know the, having the, the technical ability to do something like that. Um, obviously, uh, that, that's all I have to say. I don't know much about it. It is surprising. David, total arterialization. Well, I, I, th I think early on the concern was about you know, sternal wound healing among diabetics getting bilateral internal thoracic artery grafts, but I think more recently small studies have shown that, that not to be the case, and in fact they did have adequate uh, wound healing. I don't know if but, Rox... You know, the truth is that they're not doing it. Oh, no, no. They're, so, they're no, all no, saying, no, let's bring no, them no, to I, cabbage, but they're not doing it, well, yeah, Dave. I, no, no, you're right, and, and back to the Freedom Trial, I think it was, I don't know... Uh, no, f f five, I no, think 5% bilateral, bilateral memories and another 15% radial, so t total was 20% for more than one arterial graft. 80% yeah, got a single arterial graft. Yeah, but I do recall a well-known surgeon, Dr. David Taggart, pre presenting a paper, if I'm not mistaken, in New England Journal of Medicine and the European Heart, uh, European Heart uh, society meeting, there was no difference between the arterials and the, and, and the vein grafts in the 10-year follow-up, uh, except for just the lima alone. Yeah. So, and that was study was specifically designed to look at the arterial graft patterns and it was touted as the major study that definitively show how great those arterial grafts are um, long-term. And it kind of failed. That's why I like the, the, the hybrid approach as well, Dr. Fuster, as you know, Mount Sinai is the leading, uh, is the clinical trial uh, leader for the hybrid NIH study by, with uh, Dr. Anatine Jellens and Dr. Puskas. And I think I like that approach. It's kind of like using the best of both yeah. worlds. Uh, hopefully, we're uh, referring more yeah. patients to that. I was going to come in stenting of all the arteries except the LED, which is a lima, basically. But here, this leads the question, though. This is done through. Uh, the type of surgery on off, off pump and um, in the question robotic surgery and I will tell you at least for what I can read the papers coming to Jack these days this is very questionable That's not to do the Lima to the LED you have to be a real expert to do and it's a pity John is not here today but to do off pump and say you are okay and you can bypass three arteries it doesn't in general doesn't work unless you do this all the time and, um, and I guess a, a final comment, um, maybe, of things that are evolving. Uh, uh, Jeff, I am curious about this data that is coming out in the last year or two about stem cell-derived beta cells encapsulated, which you can re regenerate the pancreas. Can you tell us something about it? So it's not really sci-fi. This will be available at some point. There's a quest to try to liberate patients from uh, insulin injections and insulin pumps and to change the diabetes technology. Um, this is regenerative medicine. Um, there are trials that are underway in uh, many different countries around the world. Um, at our national meetings, we see the data. Uh, at some point, patient, uh, humans are being enrolled in these studies. And there are different modalities. There are uh, implantations in the GI tract, in the bone marrow, mm -hmm. subcutaneous. Uh, and it just remains to be seen what the final form is going to be for those stem cell therapies. OK, so um, at least to me, uh, the, the most fascinating aspect is a frustration. Rather than the new drugs doing good, I'm still seeing how the obesity epidemic is going up. You know, and that to me is a critical issue, and and so forth. And how difficult is for people to counteract uh, uh, to counteract that particular problem. And uh, anyway, this is somewhat frustrating in a way. And um, I like to ask if you have we have one minute or two for questions or comments. I have a question, Doctor Doctor Fuster. When are you bringing Familia to Kentucky? Familia. You mean the trial? The familia study. Oh, no, I know. When are you bringing well, it to Kentucky? Well, I didn't Kentucky? want to comment, but yeah, what she's saying is, I believe the future of children yeah. is an educational, cultural thing that you start yes. at a young age. I, this is the way we are really working on. We are working now with 50,000 children across the world, which is an educational project, project of age three to six. Uh, spending uh, about 50, 60 hours of teaching children uh, over a, a six-month period about health. And the results are quite fascinating thus far. So uh, the question is whether 
you tell a child at this early age, you create that culture that probably comes up later on when you are an adult. This is basically the principle that we are really following. Well, anyway, uh, very nice. Uh, yeah, a question? Sorry, yes, Dr. Miller. and the LED is clean, but there are significant lesions in the circ and in the right. Does a stent, stenting or medical therapy make a difference? Do we have data on that? Yeah, well, I, I think that's what you have to do. Uh, already you have a CTA with significant lesions and you're concerned about silent ischemia and all that. You have to do an, um, an FFR-guided approach for these uh, lesions and uh, hopefully that will make a difference. No, we, we know the patient has significant lesions, so I suspect that they will show ischemia. I'm asking if that patient is medically well-treated. In a diabetic patient, stenting them will improve their survival or will improve events or no? And I, I'm not sure that I, we have the data. I'm just curious about that. No, single, of course. Single well, or double non-LAD lesion? For non-LAD, you don't even have the data for cabbage. So uh, let alone for non-LAD, there's no data for, for cabbage either. So I would say that if there are relatively focal lesions and there are the high grade of the stenosis and an ischemic, uh, lesions, then you should definitely go ahead, or at least I would definitely go ahead, or I would recommend to you we go ahead. But Dr. But Dr. Miller, let me say, we do, as you said, we do not have data in reducing the heart outcomes by doing revascularization in a stable patient who is in this way, and that is why we are doing the ischemia study. And the ischemia study will have these types of patients who have Moderate, if there was moderate ischemia, where you do medical management versus a revascularization approach, and those data should be out at AHA this year, 2019. Dr. Rosenson, you have any comments? You are involved with all these trials with PCSK9 or anything on diabetes? versus placebo, and in the uh, trial, there was clearly no increase in, uh, you, know, uh, you know, glycemic status, but importantly, remnant lipoproteins were reduced after a uh, mixed meal, and the reason that uh, they're reduced is because you're upregulating the ApoBE or LDL receptor, and so I think the benefits in diabetes patients actually may be greater than uh, some of the trials may indicate. With that being said, uh, in the paper we wrote for you and Jack, the NNT for diabetes patients is, uh, you know, lower than it is for non-diabetes patients who are treated with a PCSK9 inhibitor. The last thing is that uh, we just got our funds today for the Metchnikov uh, trial, which is looking at biocellular inflammatory pathways in patients with coronary disease and diabetes and microalbuminuria, and we're actually exploring some of the non-hepatic mediators um, you know, with uh, PCSK9 inhibitor, I think we'll, I'm hoping that we're going to provide some new direction to this uh, story because I think inflammation is really key there. Okay, well, thank you very much to all of you and to you for attending.